The House comes in at noon Eastern. They'll spend the day on federal aviation programs. Members will consider more than 30 amendments to the measure this afternoon. You can see the House live on C-SPAN. And now to live coverage of the U.S. Senate here on C-SPAN 2. Black will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, you have given us the great hope that your kingdom shall come on earth. Use the members of this body to work for that glorious day when your will is done on earth even as it is done in heaven. Open the minds of our senators to the counsels of eternal wisdom, breathing into their souls your peace which passes understanding. Give them the grace to seek first your kingdom and help them to grow as you add to them all things needful. Lord, empower them through exemplary living to make this nation a shining city upon a hill. We pray in your gracious name. Amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., March 31st, 2011. To the Senate, under the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Tom Udall, a senator from the state of New Mexico, to perform the duties of the chair, signed Daniel K. Inouye, President Pro Tempore. Mr. President. Majority leaders recognized. We're continuing to work very, very hard to avoid the terrible consequences that would come with the government shutdown. As Vice President Biden announced last night, after an hour and a half meeting we had in his office here, just a few feet from where I speak, he announced that Democrats and Republicans have agreed upon a number on which to base our budget cuts. That number is $73 billion below the President's budget proposal. Now we have to figure out how to get to that 73 number. As I've said all along, this isn't just about dollars and deficits, Mr. President. It's about principles and priorities. What we cut is much more important than how much we cut. The media is very concerned with which party will win this fight politically. I'm much more concerned with making sure the American people don't lose out in this program that we're doing. We have to make sure that the cuts are those that don't really damage the basic fiber of our country. Let me once again remind the Senate. Children, students, teachers, nurses, and seniors would be significantly hurt by the cuts in the Republican past H.R. 1. The Tea Party's here today. They're here demonstrating that H.R. 1 should be followed, Mr. President. $100 billion damaging children, students, teachers, nurses, seniors, and many other people in this country. H.R. 1, Mr. President, is not a piece of legislation anyone should be proud of. Not a single child, not a single student, not a single teacher, not a single nurse, not a single police officer, not a single senior led us into this recession. Not one. And punishing innocent bystanders will not lead us to a recovery. We'll continue talking and continue working to find a middle ground. Again, Mr. President, we've agreed on a number. We haven't agreed how to get to that number. I hope an agreement can be reached as how do we get to that number. But it will not come on the backs of middle class families and the jobs they need. And it will not come if the other side continues to insist on unreasonable Tea Party unrealistic cuts. 
I appreciate Speaker Boehner and the rest of his Republican leadership in the House. What a tremendously difficult job they have. I'm sure it's not easy trying to negotiate with the Tea Party screaming in their ears. We have a lot more work to do. This country is at crossroads in a lot of different ways, Mr. President. The economy is recovering, not as much and not as rapidly as we'd like. But we can't have what's going on here with the Tea Party demonstrating all these very harsh cuts with unrealistic riders punishing innocent folks just for political ideology. So we have a lot more to do. I hope that this latest development is the beginning of the end of this crisis. Because remember, we, this isn't the only crisis that we as a country are dealing with. We have about a score of ships from our Navy trying to help the good people of Japan. We've got a big situation going on in the Middle East, not only in Libya, but all over the Middle East. We've got a war going on in Afghanistan as we speak. We have men and women whose lives are online in Afghanistan. We're trying to draw down in Iraq. Uh, we have just a lot of issues, Mr. President, that we need to deal with. We, are, we know that there has to be budget cuts, and we're willing to do that. But let's also understand we can't balance our budget with what the Tea Party is wanting us to do. We have a huge problem in this country with deficits. Now, Mr. President, we have been a pretty good example of how we can balance the budget. We did it in the Clinton years. We spent far less money than we were taking in. We were reducing the debt. We were not having annual deficits. So we know it can be done. But we have to do it in the right way, as we did. We want to work with our Republican colleagues. We've proven that we can do that with the two short-term CRs that we've had. But I hope that everyone understands that there's only so much that the middle class of this country can take. There's only so much that we can do to damage the basic fiber of our children, our students, our teachers, our nurses, and our seniors. Uh, Mr. President, Head Start is a program that's been around for decades, and it helps a lot. It helps little boys and girls learn to read and do their math that they wouldn't ordinarily have opportunity to do this. Really poor children. What, what the HR1 does is cut hundreds of thousands of little boys and girls from those programs. That doesn't, that doesn't help our country. We know that cuts must be made, but they must be smart cuts. And we want to do the best we can to work together to do whatever is reasonable to reduce this debt that we have. But we know it can be done. It's been done in recent history. Mr. President, following any legal remarks, there will be a period of morning business for senators. Uh, during that period of time, they'll be able to speak for up to 10 minutes each. The first hour is equally divided in control, with the majority controlling the first 30 minutes and the Republicans controlling the next 30 minutes. We hope to work out an agreement to vote on 1099 and the EPA amendments to the Small Business Jobs Bill today. We've been trying to do that for several days. A number of members of the Senate are attending the funeral for the late Geraldine Ferraro. That funeral takes place in New York this morning. Senators will be notified when votes are scheduled. They will be this afternoon at the earliest. Okay. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the Senate will be in a period of morning business with senators President, permitted to Ms. speak President, therein Ms. for up to 10 Ms. minutes President, each. Ms. President. The majority leader. Yeah. Uh, could that announcement come in just a minute? The Republican leader is on his way in. And if you would uh, withhold that, and the Republican leader will make his statement. Chair will do so. The time will start leader's request. Properly at that point.
Mr. President. Republican leader is recognized. Are we in a quorum call? No, we aren't. <clears throat> Mr. President, anyone who follows national politics knows that when it comes to a lot of the issues America cares about the most, the Democratic leaders in Washington are pretty far outside the mainstream. That's why we've got one Democratic leader coaching his colleagues to describe any Republican idea as extreme. And that's why other Democrats are attempting to marginalize an entire group of people in this country whose concerns about the growth of the nation's debt, the overreach of the federal government, and last year's health care bill are about as mainstream as it gets. I'm referring, of course, to the Tea Party, a loosely knit movement of everyday Americans from across the country who got so fed up with the direction they saw lawmakers from both parties taking our country a couple of years ago so they decided to stand up and make their voices heard. Despite the Democrat leadership's talking points, these folks are not radicals. They're our next door neighbors and our friends. By and large, they're housewives, professionals, students, parents, and grandparents. After last fall's election, a number of them are now members of Congress. And later on today, we'll hear from many of them outside the Capitol. These are everyday men and women who love their country and who don't want to see it collapse as a result of irresponsible attitudes and policies that somehow persist around here, despite the warning signs we see all around us about the consequences of fiscal recklessness. And they're being vilified because in an effort to preserve what's good about our country, they're politely asking lawmakers here in Washington to change the way things are done around here. So this morning I thought we would step we, excuse me. So this morning I thought we could step back and take a look at some of the things they are proposing and then let people decide for themselves who they think is extreme. At a time when the national debt has reached crisis levels, members of the Tea Party are asking that we stop spending more than we take in. In other words, they're asking that lawmakers in Washington do what any household in America already does. They want us to balance our budget. And they do this because they know their history and that the road to decline is paved with debt. Is that extreme? They want us to be able to explain how any law that we pass is consistent with the Constitution. This means that as we write new laws, they want us to be guided by the document that every single senator in this chamber has sworn to uphold. Is that extreme? They want us to cut down on the amount of money the government spends. Well, this year, the federal government in Washington is projected to spend about $1.6 trillion more than it has. That means we'll have to borrow it from somewhere else, driving the national debt even higher than it already is. What's more, the Obama administration plans to continue spending like this for years, so that within five years, the debt will exceed $20 trillion dollars. Given these facts, you tell me, is it extreme to propose that we cut spending? What else? Well, a lot of people in the Tea Party think that the health care bill the Democrats passed last year should be repealed and replaced with real reforms that actually lower costs. Is that extreme? Here's a bill that expected that's expected to lead to about 80,000 fewer jobs, which will cause federal health care spending to go up, compel millions to ch change the health care plans they have and like, and which is already driving individual and family insurance premiums up dramatically. Businesses are being hammered by its regulations and its mandates. A majority of states are working to overturn it. And two federal judges have ruled that one of its central provisions violates the U.S. Constitution. None of this sounds extreme to me. In fact, if you ask me, the goals of the Tea Party sound pretty reasonable. These folks recognize the gravity of the problems we face as a nation, and they're doing something about it for the sake of our future. They're engaged in the debate about spending and debt which is a lot more than we can say about the president and many Democrats here in Congress. They're making their voices heard, and they've succeeded in changing the conversation here in Washington from how to grow government to how to shrink it. In my view, 
The Tea Party has had an overwhelmingly positive impact on the most important issues of the day. It's helped focus the debate. It's provided a forum for Americans who felt left out of the process to have a voice and make a difference. And it's already leading to good results. It may take some time, but thanks to everyday Americans like these getting involved, speaking their minds, and advocating for common sense reforms, I'm increasingly confident we'll get our fiscal house in order. And Republicans are determined to do our part to advance the goals that I've mentioned. That's why we've been fighting to cut spending in the near term, and that's why we'll soon be proposing a balanced budget amendment. American families have to balance their budgets. So should their elected representatives in Washington. It's not too much to expect that lawmakers spend no more than they take in, unless you think it's extreme to balance the books. And that brings us to the heart of the matter. The last time the Senate voted on a balanced budget amendment in 1997, the federal deficit was a little over $100 billion. Today, it's about $1.6 trillion. Back then, the national debt was about $5.5 trillion. Today, it's closer to $14 trillion. Back then, the amendment failed by just one vote, just one. Today, Democrats are already lining up against it. So what's extreme is the thought that government can just continue on this reckless path without consequence. What's extreme is thinking we can just blithely watch the nation's debt get bigger and bigger and pretend it doesn't matter. What's extreme is spending more than a trillion and a half dollars than we have in a single year. This is the Democrats' approach. That is what is extreme. The sad truth is, as our fiscal problems have become deeper, Democrats in Washington and many others in state houses across the country have become increasingly less concerned about the consequences. Look no further than the ongoing spending debate in which Democrats have fought tooth and nail over a proposal to cut a few billion dollars at a time when we're borrowing about four billion dollars a day and our national debt stands at 14 trillion dollars. The president has the president has set the debate out entirely, and Democrats have the nerve to call anyone who expresses concern an extremist. If you're wondering the Tea Party, where the Tea Party came from, look no further than that. Mr. President, um, I yield for under, under the previous order, the Senate will be in the period of morning business with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each, with the first hour equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees, with the majority controlling the first 30 minutes and the Republicans controlling the next 30 minutes. Mr. President. Senator from Washington is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I come to the floor this morning to mark the one-year anniversary of a terrible tragedy in my home state of Washington and to once again honor the memories of those who were killed. On April 2, 2010, a fire broke out at the Tesoro Refinery in Anacortes, Washington and claimed the lives of seven workers, Daniel J. Aldridge, Matthew C. Bowen, Donna Van Drummel, Matt Gumbel, Darren J. Hoynes, Lou Jans, and Catherine Powell. These were men and women who were taken too young, with so much life to live, and with so many people to live it with. Workers who took on tough jobs, worked long hours during difficult economic times to provide for their families. They were people who made tremendous sacrifices and who embodied so much of what is good about the community they lived in. And Mr. President, they have been dearly missed. Even now, one year later, there is nothing we can say to make the pain go away for the mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, co-workers, family members who still bear those deep scars of loss. But Mr. President, the Anacortes community is strong, and while they have endured more than their fair share of pain over the years, their resiliency and compassion have carried them forward. Over the past year, we have seen homes and hearts and pocketbooks open to the families who lost so much. Because this community understands the pain of a loss like this, 
can't be overcome or forgotten. And they know these families should never have to bear that pain alone. So, Mr. President, we owe it to the Anacortes community to honor those they have lost. And we owe it to them to do everything we can to make sure that tragedies like that never happen again. State investigators have determined that that tragedy could have been and should have been prevented. The problems that led to what happened were known beforehand, and they should have been fixed. And that is heartbreaking. Every worker in every industry deserves to be confident that while they are working hard and doing their jobs, their employers are doing everything they can to protect them. So I want you to know I'm going to keep working to make sure the oil and gas industry improves their safety practices because we owe that to our workers and to their families and to communities like Anacortes all across our country. Mr. President, one year after that tragedy, my thoughts and prayers and condolences remain with the families who have endured so much pain. And my profound thanks goes out to the Anacortes community that has been with those families every step of the way. So I am proud to introduce a Senate resolution with my colleague, Senator Cantwell, which we'll be doing later today to recognize the anniversary of this tragedy on April 2, 2011. And I urge my colleagues to join in remembering those workers in Anacortes who were taken from us far too soon. Thank you. I yield the floor, and I suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Morning business in the Senate for the rest of this morning as a number of senators are attending the funeral of former New York Congresswoman and vice presidential candidate Geraldine Ferraro. She passed away last Saturday after battling cancer. She was 75. Deliberations are expected to continue this afternoon in a measure senators have been working on all week, a small business bill that would continue programs helping small high-tech and research startup companies. Votes on up to 10 amendments are expected this afternoon. And Senate leadership is aiming to have a final passage vote on the bill before the end of the week. As this quorum call continues, we'll go live to the Rayburn House office building on Capitol Hill. This morning, the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee is holding a hearing to investigate allegations that Homeland Security's political appointees are stonewalling Freedom of Information Act requests. This hearing got underway at 9.30 Eastern. His transparency and open government memorandum, he committed this administration to an, quote, unprecedented level of openness in government, unquote. And in his Freedom of Information Act memorandum, he stressed the importance of FOIA, stating that it is, quote, the most prominent expression of a profound national commitment to ensuring an open government, unquote. To reinforce this commitment to transparency, Attorney General Holder, in March of 2009, issued a guidance memorandum that, among other things, reiterated the President's call for proactive disclosure in anticipation of public interest, required agencies to consider making partial disclosures whenever full disclosure of a record is not possible, and urged agencies to create and maintain effective systems for responding to requests. Against this backdrop, the Department's lawyers provide day-to-day -day legal advice to the Department's chief FOIA officer, her staff, and others in headquarters and our components who are responsible for responding to FOIA requests. In doing so, the lawyers who practice in this area provide legal advice on specific requests and potentially responsive records, and they do so based on their best understanding of the facts and their best legal analysis and interpretation of the FOIA statute, the relevant case law, and applicable guidance. 
With respect to the involvement of the Office of the Secretary and other senior department leaders in being informed of significant events affecting the department, including the release of significant departmental information, the Secretary and her staff have, in my view, clear statutory authority to ask questions of, review, and manage the operations of all parts of the department, including the Privacy Office and its elements that handle the FOIA process. Thank you, Mr. President. I wanted to come to the floor today to talk a little bit about the state of public education in this country, especially uh, when it comes to the condition of poor children in the United States, in part because I think it is urgent uh, that we fix No Child Left Behind, a law that is not working well uh, for kids and for teachers, for moms and dads all across the United States and certainly in my home state of Colorado. Sometimes uh, people that aren't engaged in the work of teaching our kids, which is I think the hardest work that anybody can do short of going to war, don't realize just how horrific the outcomes are for children uh, in this great country of ours, especially children living in poverty. And sometimes when I'm on this floor uh, where there are a hundred deaths, there are a hundred senators, I think a little bit about what the condition would be of the people here uh, if they were not senators, but if these hundred people were poor children living in the United States of America in the 21st century. First of all, Mr. President, it's important to recognize that of, of the hundred senators, of the hundred kids in this great country, 42 of the hundred would be living in poverty. 42 out of 100 would be poor. Of those senators, now poor children, living in this country, by the age of four, as this chart shows, they would have heard only one-third of the words heard by their more affluent peers. They're living in poverty. They've heard 13 million words. A child in a professional family has heard 45 million words. There isn't a kindergarten teacher in this country that wouldn't tell you that that makes an enormous difference right out of the chutes. By age four, only 39 of the 100 children can recognize the letters of the alphabet. Just 39 of 100 by age four. In contrast, 85% of the children coming from middle class families can recognize the letters of the alphabet. Again, there's not a kindergarten teacher, there's not a high school teacher that wouldn't tell you that that makes an enormous difference to kids when they come to school in terms of their readiness to learn. But what happens, Mr. President, when they go to school, when they're actually in our school? By the fourth grade, only 17 out of 100 children in poverty can read at grade level. 17. That's fewer kids than there are deaths in this section of the Senate floor. The entire rest of the floor would be kids that cannot read at grade level by the fourth grade. These kids are reading at grade level. Everyone else all across this beautiful chamber would not be able to read at grade level. In America, in the 21st century, only this section can read proficiently. It's worse. By the eighth grade, only 16 of our kids can read at grade level. Could wander around the entire rest of this chamber looking for somebody who can read proficiently, and I wouldn't be able to find them. I've been in classrooms, as you know, Mr. President, all across my state, all across the great city of Denver, and all across this country. And in my view, there is nothing more at war with who we are as Americans or who we are as Coloradans than a fifth grade child reading at the first grade level. There's a lot of discussion on this floor about your moral right to this and your moral right to that. I can't think of anything less American than a child in the fifth grade doing first grade math. Speaking of math, in a world where technology and 
engineering and invention uh, is going to dominate the 21st century economy. How are we doing in math? 17 of our kids at the eighth grade are proficient mathematicians. You know, when I took the job as superintendent of schools in Denver, a district of 75,000 children, one of the greatest cities in, in the greatest country in the world, on the 10th grade math test that the state administers, Mr. President, in that district of 75,000 children, there were 33 African American students proficient on that test and 61 Latino students proficient on that test. Fewer than four classrooms worth of kids proficient on a test that measures, if we're honest with ourselves, which we're not, a junior high school standard of mathematical proficiency in Europe. That's what we're doing to our kids. By the end of high school, if this Senate were a classroom of four children in this country, only 57 of us would be around to graduate. And only 25 are actually ready for college or ready for a career. That's a quarter of this room. 75, you can just write them off. 75 of these tests. And it gets even worse after that because of our 100 children, only nine will graduate from college. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. These two rows of deaths, these two rows of deaths, Mr. President, represent children coming from zip codes where they're living in poverty and who ultimately make it through and graduate from college. That's it. Two rows in one section of the United States Senate. No one in these rows will graduate from college and no one in any of these desks from here to the other side of this floor will graduate from college. That's been true for a generation, Mr. President. And if we don't do things differently, it's going to be true for this generation of kindergartens if we don't change what we do. Sometimes people think this is someone else's problem. It's not a question of national interest. I can't imagine why anybody would think that, but some people do. McKinsey, the consulting group, has done a study that shows that the effect of this dropout rate that we have creates a permanent recession in our economy, as great as the one that we've been through. In other words, if we're graduating these kids from college, our economic growth would be far greater than it is right now. And you can see the effect in this, this recession that we just came out of on people with less than a high school diploma. The unemployment rate was 15.3 percent. You can see the numbers here, but if you had a bachelor's degree or higher, your unemployment rate was 4 percent. 15 percent versus 4 percent in this recession that we just went through. But the point is also that it creates a chronic recession, a drag on our economy, not to mention the fact that if you go to the prisons in this country and you ask people, did you graduate from high school, the answer is that somewhere in the neighborhood of 85% of the people in our prisons are high school dropouts. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to figure out how you might start solving that problem by actually graduating kids from high school and getting them ready for college. Again, it's not, this isn't about we're kind of, sort of doing okay. Nine kids from poverty, on average, making it through to a college degree. Ninety-one not. It's not as though that's, those odds are somehow fairly distributed across the population in the United States of America. Huge international implications, Mr. President, of all this as well. And you can see uh, these are our students compared to their international peers on the eighth grade uh, math test. And you can see that our Anglo kids are scoring up here. Korea, Singapore, Japan, Anglo kids in the United States of America. The U.S. average is here, so you've got to go Hungary, England, Russian Federation, U.S. average. I don't know why we wouldn't want to be first 
but we're not first. But look at how our Latino kids are doing and our African American kids are doing. Armenia, Australia, Sweden, Malta, Scotland, Serbia, Italy, our Latino kids. Way down here. But let's keep going. Malaysia, Norway, Cyprus, Bulgaria, Israel, Ukraine, Romania, our U.S. African American students, right above Bosnia, two spots above Lebanon. Think about it through the eyes of one of our African American students living in a neighborhood in poverty, in Chicago or Denver or Los Angeles or Boston. What are the odds that you think you're actually going to be able to graduate, that you're going to be able to contribute to the democracy, contribute meaningfully to our economy, compete in this global economy? They're not long. They're not long, and they know they're not long. Mr. President, I'll close just by saying that we can't fix this problem from Washington. We can't. But we can call attention to the question. We can create policies and, and, and suggestions about how people ought to do the work differently. Having served as a superintendent in an urban school district for almost four years and spent time with our kids, spent time with our teachers, I know we can succeed. The kids have the intellectual capacity to do the work. There's no doubt that they do. But they are in a system that was designed deep in the last century. In fact, if we're honest about it, a lot of the way the system was designed was in colonial America. And in my judgment, it's time for the burden to shift from the people that want to change the system to the people that want to keep it the same. There were nights sometimes in the school board meetings when people would come and they'd say, Michael, how do you sleep at night doing this and doing that and trying to change this and worrying about that? And, and I would say to them, uh, the reason I can sleep at night is that I don't think we could do any worse than we're doing. So we ought to think about stopping doing what we're doing and figure out how to change the way we think about recruiting, retaining, and inspiring teachers in the 21st century. We ought to elevate standards so that we're not kidding ourselves across the country about whether we're competing with our international rivals and, and we stop cheating our kids by telling them they're succeeding when they're not compared to kids across the globe. We've got to get out of the business of measuring things that don't make any sense to anybody right now that's working in our schools. Who cares how this year's fourth graders did compared to last year's fourth graders. What we need to know is how did this group of fifth graders do compared to how they did as fourth graders, compared to how they did as third graders. That's just common sense, but that's not the way the law works today. I, I see my colleague is here from Georgia, so I'll close, but I want to say this first. We cannot keep No Child Left Behind the way that it is. It is contributing to the problem that's out there. It is making the work harder to do, not easier to do, for our teachers, for our principals, and for our kids. Our moms and dads are right to point out that it's measuring the wrong thing and thinking about data in the wrong way. And we ought to take this opportunity in a bipartisan way to fix No Child Left Behind, to lift some of that burden from our kids and from our teachers and our principals. And what we have to do as we're doing that is we've got to point to the places where it's actually working to demonstrate that the fact that you're born into a zip code defined by poverty doesn't mean your life is going to be defined by poverty. We need to point to examples of people that have managed to struggle through, or schools that have managed to struggle through and beat the odds and send 95 and 98 percent of their poor children on to get a college degree. And we need to be asking ourselves why we're not achieving that at scale. I am the proud father of three little girls, and I can tell you that if anyone in this body, anyone in this body, faced the same odds for their children or for their grandchildren that poor children in America face, there is no way that we wouldn't be talking about this issue night and day. In fact, people might give up, I might give up, and rush home and say, I'm going to take my kids out of that place they are in, and I'm going to put them in a place with the finest teachers, and I'm going to 
give up this Senate floor to make sure as a parent that I'm involved in their education. There is no way we would accept these odds for our own children. And what I would argue is that the children that I'm talking about are our children. Remember, 42 out of 100 are living in poverty in this country. What's our answer for them, Mr. President? So I look forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of this aisle to not make excuses, to not find a reason why we can't lead, to not find a reason why we can't fix No Child Left Behind, but instead to create some hope for children all across our country living in urban and rural areas that are suffering this horrible plight. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Senator from Georgia is recognized. Mr. President, I'd ask unanimous consent that the remaining time for the majority be reserved. Without objection. Mr. President, I'd like to be recognized as if in morning business, which I guess we are in morning business. So That's, that's correct. Uh, and first of all, I want to commend the Senator from, from Colorado and, and try and ratify really what I heard him saying. I came in at the last part of the speech, but I know his focus was on the Elementary and Secondary Ed Education Act and No Child Left Behind. And he's exactly right. There are reforms that do need to take place. And we've gone three years without a reauthorization. And reauthorization hopefully can happen this year. And when it does, we can improve the plight of our children and we can reform the way we do some of the things in ESEA to open up new opportunity for our kids. But accepting the status quo, he's right, is not good enough. We need to make those reforms and we need to make them now. And I personally look forward to the opportunity of working with a senator from Colorado in the Health and Education and Labor Committee when that issue comes up to reform ESEA, get it reauthorized, and re-empower our teachers, our students, our parents, and raise the level of education for all Americans. And I commend him for his great contribution to Colorado and further to the United States uh, Senate. And I'm going to steal a line that he just gave us a minute ago. When I walked in, he was saying, there's some things Congress can't do. And he's right. Education does take place at the local level. There are some things we can fix in Washington, but it's primarily done at the local level. But there is one thing Congress can fix. And that's our spending, our debt, and our deficit. And for just a second, I want to speak not in the tone of a politician, not as somebody as a part of the institution that's trying to talk about what he thinks. I want to talk about what I think the people of Georgia think. The people of Georgia really don't understand why we can't do in Washington what they've had to do during the last three years. During the economic travails of the last few years, every American family, every American family, has had to sit around their kitchen table, reprioritizing how they spend their money, deal with lower returns on their investments, the consequences of unemployment or underemployment. They've had to adapt to difficult economic times. Yet when they turn on the television and they look at C-SPAN, they don't see us adapting to the economic times we find ourselves in as a country. You know, I was in the real estate business for 33 years, and I don't understand a lot of things, but I understand leverage. Leverage is a marvelous thing in capitalism. It's, if you've got proper leverage in real estate or proper leverage in business, it can make a lot of things happen. Leverage is good, but too much leverage is a death sentence. And we're at a precipice in this country. We're at a precipice where we're about to fall off, and if we fall off, there is no recovery because the results of continued deficit spending and continued increased debts are two things inflating the dollar in future years to pay that debt off with cheaper dollars, which devalues every asset of American, every American family, and increasing interest rates to unsustainable and unpayable amounts. I lived through that once in the post-Carter um, years of 1980, and 83, when we dealt with the misery index in America, double-digit inflation, double-digit unemployment, and double-digit interest rates. We basically, in my home state of Georgia today, we do have double-digit unemployment today, 10.4 percent. Interest rates are low, but it's arbitrary, and they're getting ready to go up. The yield spread curve between two-year federal debt and 10-year U.S. debt is triple, which indicates the markets that are buying our debt are already looking out to the future and saying interest rates are going higher, three times what they are now, maybe more. And if you look at inflation, Inflation is arbitrarily low right now, but with what's happening to food and prices contributed by gasoline and petroleum, what we see happening in the world marketplaces, it's an inevitable factor unless we get our arms around our debt and our deficit. 
Now, we owe about $14 trillion in debt. The deficit this year is over $1.5 trillion. Those are unsustainable numbers. We don't have to pay the debt off today. We don't have to reduce the deficit to zero. But we have to get ourselves on a guide path to reducing our deficit and, in turn, reducing our debt over time. And it means we have to sit down at our kitchen table, the floor of the United States Senate, the floor of the United States House, prioritize what we're doing, and get to the business the American people expect us to get to. We're playing some political games right now with short-term CRs when the big votes, the big debates, and the big decisions loom ahead. First, the debt ceiling, later the FY12 appropriations. And there are three things I hope we will do. Number one is recognize our system today is broken and is not working. I did a little research. Most of my years in Congress, more dollars have been appropriated through omnibus appropriations than through legitimate debate of budget units on the floor. We didn't do any last year. The reason we're doing a CR this year on last year because it was an omnibus appropriation. We're not spending our money like the American people have to spend theirs. We're not prioritizing. We're not looking at cost-benefit analysis. We've got to change our system. I am pleased to have joined with uh, former Governor Shaheen of New Hampshire, a Democratic colleague, to introduce the, balance, the Biennial Budget and Appropriations Act for the Congress, an act that mimics what 20 of our states, 40 percent of the country, already does. And that is appropriate on a two-year cycle rather than a one-year cycle. Appropriate in odd-numbered years so that in even-numbered years, which also happen to be election years, we don't do appropriating, we do oversight. We spend a year not making political promises of what bacon we're going to bring home, but we spend a year looking for savings and redundancy and duplication and waste in federal spending. You know, if you don't spend a minute looking back, you can never spend a minute looking forward. And right now, we don't spend any time looking back and seeing where money's being spent and where it might be saved. We don't reprioritize those things that were introduced and established years ago. The Biennial Budget and Appropriations Action Act requires the President of the United States to submit a biennial budget, requires Congress to act on the independent budget units in a two-year fashion in the odd-numbered year, and requires the oversight in even-numbered years of every function of the federal government. We don't do oversight anymore, and we're paying a terrible price for it. That's the first thing that we need to do. The second thing we need to do is understand that we need to appropriate our money the way the American people appropriate their money. They measure the benefit compared to the cost, and if the benefit to their family is not equal or greater than the cost, they don't spend the money. But in the United States Congress today, we don't measure cost-benefit analysis. We measure how much more we can spend in continuation to what we appropriate in a previous year. And that's a broken system, and it's a broken cycle. I commend Senator Corker on his introduction of the CAP Act, which is the second part of what we need to do, and that's put ourselves in some type of fiscal constraint through a balanced budget amendment and through a spending cap. You know, a little-known secret is the nation of Israel, which two years ago confronted problems like the ones we have today burgeoning debt, a bigger deficit, and spending problem. Prime Minister Netanyahu and their finance minister sat down at their kitchen table in Israel in Tel Aviv, and they established a biennial budget process of two-year appropriations rather than one, of even-numbered election oversight and odd-numbered appropriating. And then they did a second thing. They put a cap on their debt, and they put a cap on spending. And you know what happened in two years' time? Israel's GDP has grown by 7.9 percent. The International Monetary Fund and the World Bank have told the EU and some of the struggling countries in the EU, like Portugal and like Spain, that they should adopt the biennial spending process and the oversight process of a biennial budget and appropriation act. Well, I would say this. If 20 of our states are doing it, and they're 20 of our most fiscally sound states, beginning with New Hampshire and Nebraska and Oregon and states like that, and if Israel has done it and demonstrated in difficult world economic times they can grow their GDP by 7.9 percent and reduce their debt and cap their spending, and if the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund are telling the European Union, which is in most difficult straits today, that it's the answer, part of the answer to how they spend their money and getting an arm around their spending, then I think we should take a look at it and it should be on the floor of the United States Senate being debated. We have a window of opportunity. 
We have the chance to reform our spending process, to set ourselves on a glide path to reducing our debt and reducing our deficit over time and send a signal to the world market that the strong America they've known and invested in is going to be even stronger in the future. But if we continue to dilly-dally around, making, trying to make political headway out of economic events and push ourselves out in time on debt and deficit, we're going to have higher inflation, higher interest rates, we're going to devalue the assets of the American people, and worst of all, we're going to lose our place in the world. I don't want to be a part of that. The President doesn't want to be a part of that. I don't think any member of the Senate wants to be a part of that. So my encouragement to the leadership, Democratic and Republican alike, let's let the best ideas flow. Let's let them come to the floor of the Senate and let's debate them. And let's invite the President to come and sit down with us and do the same thing. Instead of taking entitlements off the table, they ought to be part of the discussion. Instead of saying there's some things I'm not going to do and some things I will, we ought to be open and say we'll look at everything and then we'll prioritize based on cost versus benefit. If we do that, we'll do what the people of Georgia expect me to do and I think what the people of the United States expect all of us to do. Mr. President, we have a great country made great by great people who made difficult decisions in difficult times. This is the difficult decision facing our time. I want to be one of the people that's a part of the solution, not a footnote in history to the beginning of the decline of the United States of America. And I yield back the balance of my time and suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Mr. President. I is recognized. Uh, I would ask that the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, I just had a couple of things to say this morning. First and briefly, I want to and probably will support the military action in Libya. I, I've been inclined to think that uh, careful surgical use of our forces could make a positive difference uh, to the degree it would be worth the risk of that involvement, but I'm not really sure of that. I'm rather senior member of the Armed Services Committee. Um, these are matters that we're not totally unfamiliar with. I was very confident from the beginning that we could execute a no-fly zone uh, very effectively uh, that it wouldn't be uh, that there's risk, but not great risk because of our military capabilities. However, I, I do believe that over a number of years, the Congress and the American people have expressed grave concern over the executive branch uh, committing the United States to military actions without full participation of the uh, executive branch. Now, we have not used the declaration of war mechanism, uh, truthfully, uh, uh, as the defining act for most of our military actions in recent years. We've used uh, authorization of military force uh, uh, resolutions that authorized the president to uh, utilize military force. Uh, we spent weeks doing that before the Iraq invasion, not weeks, months. In fact, as I recall, the authorization for u utilization of military force in Iraq was passed in the fall, I believe October, uh, and the uh, actual invasion didn't occur till the next spring in March. Uh, during that time, we had many, many hearings. We had full debate. Uh, there were resolution after resolution in the UN, uh, but Congress was fully on top of all of it. They knew what the matters, what, what was at stake, and we voted. Some voted no and complained uh, and continued to complain. Uh, but for the most part, those who voted no supported the action because we'd been uh, involved in a discussion that uh, was real about the risk uh, and so forth. Then you had 
other actions such as Grenada and Panama that had less debate by Congress and people have not been happy about that. They felt like uh, there should have been more. Uh, I would just say, in my opinion, the consultative process for this military engagement was unacceptable. It did not have to occur so in this fashion. There was ample opportunity to discuss it. Senator Susan Collins uh, on the Armed Services Committee a few days ago, uh, uh, we had top Defense Department officials there, Admiral Stavridis, who chair, who's the uh, commander of NATO forces, uh, was testifying, and she said, well, we had time, it appears, uh, to consult and get a vote in the UN. We had time to consult and get a vote in NATO. Uh, the Arab League uh, apparently found time to reach some sort of consensus, uh, but we didn't have time to involve the United States Congress. Well, that struck me as a very, very legitimate and serious statement. And I think Senator Collins was correct. There was am ample opportunity to consult Congress. This was a war, to use a phrase of, in recent years, of choice. It was not a military action that was demanded because we had been attacked uh, on our soil or in our legitimate bases somewhere around the world, and we had to defend ourselves immediately. Um, so I'm not happy about it. I think it's a big matter. And I, I think Democrats and Republicans have the same unease about it and I believe it's time for Congress to assert itself more effectively. And we had a briefing last night uh, in uh, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. I went 50 minutes. Frankly, I didn't, I didn't get a lot out of it. Heard little that I didn't, hadn't picked up from the cable news networks. And, we turn on the television this morning and we uh, uh, see uh, uh, news about CIA uh, involvement uh, there. Uh, for good or ill, I didn't hear that discussed at our briefing. It would have been nice to have heard it uh, straight from the administration's uh, leaders rather than seeing it on television the next morning. So this is the kind of situation we're in. It's not acceptable. Uh, Congress must assert itself. Uh, this administration, surprisingly, really, based on what they have uh, said during the campaign, what President Obama said back during the campaign about, about our reluctance to uh, initiate military force, sort of surprising that we have not uh, had more consultation. So maybe it's an institutional tendency. Once you become president, you don't want to fool with Congress. Uh, they ask troublesome questions. They slow things down, maybe, although in this instance, I think we had a lot quicker response from Congress than we got from the administration. But regardless, I think we've got to confront that issue, and uh, it's time for Congress to, in a bipartisan way, ask itself first, what do we expect? What is a minimum uh, amount of congressional involvement? And then we need to make sure that every president henceforth uh, complies with at least that. And I, uh, I'm not also not happy uh, uh, the, the way some resolution was passed here. Uh, that seem to have authorized for us in some way uh, that nobody that I know of uh, in the Senate was aware that it was in the resolution when it passed. So I'm not very concerned about that. Um, on another subject, uh, Mr. President, we'll have uh, this afternoon a vote in the Budget Committee of which I'm the ranking Republican, um, on, the, on 
the nomination of Heather Higginbottom to be President Obama's Deputy Budget Director at the Office of Management and Budget. OMB is a very, very critical part of any administration of any American government. OMB is the agency that controls on behalf of the President the lust of all the agencies and departments to get more money for their budget. And they, they, they send up their request and OMB uh, is the control point for the president. He can't sit down and negotiate every single dispute over funding. Uh, and the OMB sort of handles that, controls it if there's a real loggerhead debate between cabinet officials and, and OMB. They can go directly to the president, and the president will decide it. But many times, most times, overwhelmingly, the decisions are made uh, in OMB, and it's that institution that is critical to contain the, the growing spending that we have in America. It's a very, very important position. The director, I supported his appointment, Jack Lew. Uh, he had been OMB director under President uh, Clinton. Uh, he uh, uh, was said to be the one to get credit for balancing the budget, but I do remember um, that the House Republicans under Newt Gingrich fought over uh, spending for, for months and years. Actually, for a short period of time, the government shut down. Uh, it looked like it didn't destroy America. We're still operating. But they, they fought, and they fought, and they contained and balanced the budget. So Mr. Liu was there during that period of time. Uh, certainly, uh, he deserves some credit for that, and I was pleased to support him. But I was stunningly disappointed when Mr. Liu uh, went on television and said the president's 10-year budget calls on America to live within its means, to not spend more than we take in, when over the 10-year budget, there's not a single year by the president's own budget submitted by Mr. Liu in which the deficit fell below $600 billion. And in the out years, the numbers were going up to about $800 billion. Now, since Mr. Liu submitted the president's budget, the Congressional Budget Office, a bipartisan, nonpartisan group, basically the leadership selected by the Democratic majority, analyzed Mr. Liu and President Obama's budget, and they said it's far worse than that. The lowest single deficit we'll have in 10 years is $740 billion. The highest President Bush ever had was $450. This is unbelievable. This year, the budget deficit is going to be over $1,500 billion. In the 10th year, CBO said that Mr. Liu and President Obama's budget would call for a $1.2 trillion deficit, a clearly unsustainable path of surging debt in the out years going up. And that's why Mr. Bernanke, Federal Reserve Chairman and, and Erskine Bowles, President Obama's Chairman of the Deficit Commission, and all have said this is an unsustainable path. Well, um, interest last year on the budget was about $200 billion. We paid out $200 billion to people in China and governments of China, Japan, uh, all over the world, and to American citizens who've loaned us money to pay the... Uh, so we can spend $3.8 trillion this year while we're only taking in 2.2. We have to borrow that money. We don't have that money. Forty cents of every dollar that's spent is borrowed. Well, uh, we, we get a budget for next year blithely calling for education funding to be increased 10 percent, 11 percent, calling for the Energy Department to get a 9.5 percent increase, calling for State Department to get a 10.5 percent increase, calling for huge increases in the Transportation Department, while inflation is, what, 2 percent or less? 
and deficits are surging out of control. And what do they say? These are investments. Well, sometimes you don't have money to invest. How can I buy stock if I don't have any money? Buy, I mean, you just don't have money. Reality has to break through. And the fact that the president continues to assert that his budget calls on us to live within our means when it sets forth the most irresponsible surge of debt the nation has ever seen is uh, breathtaking to me. And I'm disappointed that Mr. Liu has mouthed the same phrases. He said the same things. Uh, and, but Mr. Erskine Bowles, who co-chaired the commission that President Obama appointed, uh, he and Alan Simpson a few days ago issued a statement when they testified before the budget committee and they said this country is facing the most predictable economic crisis in its history. When asked by Senator Con uh, Conrad, our Democratic chairman, about that, he said it could be two years, Mr. Uh, Bowles said. Maybe a little less, maybe a little more, we'll have a crisis. Alan Simpson, the co-chairman of the commission, popped in and said, I think one year, I think by the end of this year, we could have a debt crisis. Well, it's time to act and get on the right path and not be in denial as we are at this time. Um, and so I asked Ms. Higginbottom about some of these issues when she came before the committee to just to try to determine whether or not uh, she understood the gravity of the situation in which uh, we're now in. I was not satisfied. First, um, uh, Ms. Higginbottom's experience level is stunningly lacking. Uh, she was a former campaign advisor to President Obama, has had no formal budget training or experience, not even a college class in economics. She said, I'm not an accountant. Yet, no, she's not an accountant. She's never served on the budget committee, never studied business, never run a business, never been a mayor of a town, never been a county commissioner who had to balance a budget or a governor or served in a governor's budget office or finance office of any kind, shape, or form. Has campaigned uh, for, uh, I think, Senator Kerry. Uh, she was at the highest job I guess she's had was uh, the, a legislative director, not the chief of staff who manages the staff, but the legislative director for Senator Kerry, who testified for her, and she is a fine person. I think uh, uh, that she seems in every way to be a decent and, and all person uh, and, and uh, would be a good legislative director uh, here in the Senate. But to be the person they look the cabinet official in the eye and say, Secretary Smith, we, you're asking for X billion dollars. We don't have it. Uh, OMB says you don't get it. Who, got, who can talk to the American people and tell them that we're in a fiscal crisis that could lead to a debt crisis to put us in another recession? a double dip, I don't think she has any comprehension of that. How could she? She's, this is not her experience. So she's been a political operative, a legislative operative, and when pressed about it, basically said that, well, you know, the president's budget is, is uh, a policy document. Well, at this point in history, we, OMB, needs to be thinking about dollars and cents, needs to be thinking about debt. And this idea that we can just spend and invest regardless of the financial consequences that 
will inevitably accrue is false. They need to be listening to someone like Erskine Bowles. We need someone like Erskine Bowles in charge of the uh, uh, OMB. When the president announced his budget that very day, he said it came nowhere close to doing what's necessary to get this country on the right track. Nowhere close. We need somebody of seriousness who, who understands the threat this country is facing and not some uh, young person. They say, well, you, you, you've uh, objected to her because she's young. I'm not, I, I, I never mentioned the word young. But she is young, but the most important thing is she does not have the kind of experience in business or accounting or budget or responsibility or management that you would look for in the second in command of the Congressional Budget Office, the most central unit in our entire governmental structure committed to containing wasteful spending. We need somebody who will go after waste, fraud, and abuse. Being a federal prosecutor, former federal prosecutor, um, see my colleague in the chair, former attorney general, a little experience in going after criminals who's tried to steal from us wouldn't hurt. It would be some value, but that, this nominee doesn't have that. So despite the fact that she is a person of character and, and, and um, a, a good personality and is liked, uh, it is uh, not... The nomination, in my view, should not go forward, and I will object to it. I know in the Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee, where she also came up, um, Senator Scott Brown asked her a, a number of questions. Um, she, he said, you'll be number two, uh, and if, if Director Lou's not there, you'll be number one, potentially. And in that respect, respect, I would presume you would be dealing with accounting and budgeting, obviously problems within OMB. Is that a fair statement? Sure. Mm-hmm. So I guess my original question is, what type of budgeting and accounting experience do you have? Higginbottom. I've done a lot of policy making. Senator Scott Brown, all right, I understand that, but I guess I'm asking, do you have any accounting or budgetary experience aside from dealing in policy matters? Higginbottom, I'm not an accountant, but the president's budget is an articulation of his policy agenda. I think that's a, that, that fails to evidence an understanding of the difficult role that the OMB has. My staff director for the minority in, in the Senate uh, Budget Committee uh, served in OMB for a while. Uh, such a wonderful person. Um, and one reason he came to my attention was because uh, a member of President Bush's administration uh, that I know well said he had to go to him and try to ask him to approve additional funding for the Department of Agency, then he said he could say no. And he would do it in a way that he, he showed he understood what we were talking about, but he wouldn't, get, he wouldn't give in and he made you respect him for it. Well, that's just kind of the nature of the OMB. All these agency departments, they want to ask more money for their departments so they can do all these good things, and somebody's got to say, this is putting us over the limit. This is putting us over our budget. We don't have this kind of money. And um, I hope that we can uh, get the kind of serious leadership in that office that does not seem to be present today by virtue of the uh, language that indicates that our OMB believes we've got a good budget that lives within our means. Most, both Director Liu and President Obama have repeatedly said that the President's budget allows us to live within our means, quote, spend money that we have each year, 
and begin paying down our debt. Numerous, I think five or six, fact-checked organizations who analyze statements to see if they're accurate or not have found these statements to be false, and they're plainly, utterly false. The lowest deficit we're going to have, according to the CBO, is $740 billion in the next 10 years, the lowest annual deficit, and our interest payment will increase from $200 billion to over $900 billion in one year, the tenth year of President Obama's budget. And so I guess I would just say, Mr. President, I get my, I don't know what time is left on this side. No, no time left. I'll wrap, wrap up and <laughs> just say that it's for those concerns that I've expressed that I will not support Heather Higginbottom as OMB Deputy Director, even though she has many fine qualities, as Senator John Kerry set forth in his testimony on her behalf, although he was not able and did not contend that she has experience in budget, accounting, or finance. I thank the Chair and would yield the floor. Uh, Mr. President, Senator from Maryland is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh